On a chilly December 6th in 1850, a ship sailed through the Golden Gate, carrying a passenger determined to change the city of San Francisco forever. His name was Joseph Sadok Alemany, a Spanish-Dominican priest who had been a missionary in Ohio and Kentucky for a decade. Six months before arriving in San Francisco, Alemany had been named Bishop of California by Pope Pius IX, who told the reluctant Alemany, you must go to California, where others are drawn by gold, you must carry the cross. The San Francisco that greeted its new bishop was a city creating itself in the midst of the gold rush. It was a place of great vice and great beauty. Now certainly Bishop Alamany would have encountered uh, gambling and prostitution and saloons, etc. But he would also would have found men and women struggling to make a community. So he would have found a city in which there was a juxtaposition of ramshackle frontier uh, serendipity and elements of elegance already, bu buildings of, uh, of distinction. He would have found a, a frontier outpost struggling to become a, a, a great city. Alamany found only two Catholic institutions in San Francisco, the recently established parish of St. Francis of Assisi and the decaying Mission Dolores. They had sold the building and they would use it for a saloon, a tavern, a dance hall, a medical link, but they did keep the chapel, so there was masses continuing on at the Mission Dolores all the time. In a letter to the Catholics, Alamany said, San Francisco is great in a commercial point of view, in population, and in the strength of its resources. And shall we not endeavor to make religion keep pace with all this progress? On July 29, 1853, the Archdiocese of San Francisco was established, and Alamany became its first archbishop. He set about building up the church in San Francisco and beyond. Over the next decade, the churches of St. Patrick, St. Mary, St. Boniface, St. Dominic, St. Ignatius, and Notre Dame de Victoire opened in the city. Churches were also established in the surrounding area, St. Raphael and Marin, and others around the bay. We have to remember how vast the Archdiocese of San Francisco was when it was established in 1853. It went up to the 42nd uh, uh, parallel, the, latitude, the border between Oregon and uh, California. It went all the way out to the Colorado River, and then as far south as San Jose. And, and from San Jose south was the Diocese of Monterey. So it was a vast area. And uh, Archbishop Alemany uh, had to travel that area and offer uh, confirmation and, and, uh, and to, to visit his parishes, etc. It was a, quite, a, quite an undertaking. That must have been an extraordinary uh, welcome sight for people in a city that was just coming of age physically to have those spires with their suggestions of a more settled urban environment. All these churches would be in the more settled areas of the city. And as such, they would help define a neighborhood. These early parishes served a diverse population of Catholics. One young seminarian was awestruck, writing, what a population, French, English, Germans, Italians, Mexicans, Americans, Indians, Canadians, and even Chinese. On land donated by pioneer entrepreneur John Sullivan, a Gothic red brick church dedicated to St. Mary of the Immaculate Conception was built at Granton, California, and dedicated on Christmas Eve, 1854. It was the largest structure yet erected in San Francisco. Well, Alamany thought that since we were, uh, we were an immigrant church, and to build a major structure said to the people, we're here and we're not going to go away, and so any discrimination that the church may have been feeling was dissipated by the fact that now we could point to the cathedral and say, look what we've built here. As the presence of the Catholic Church grew, it provided much of the social welfare in San Francisco, thanks to the efforts of women religious who built hospitals, schools, and orphanages. What we have to remember in the 1850s, the 1860s, the 1870s, there was no state departments or municipal departments of social welfare. There was a, a, a rudimentary uh, county hospital available. And uh, the church, especially the sisters, the Sisters of Mercy and the Daughters of Charity, most dramatically, came in and offered these services uh, to, to the Catholic and the non-Catholic population alike. That's an interesting thing that historians are looking at now. 
how well respected, how popular Catholic sisters in their habits were in the mid 19th century in an overwhelmingly Protestant society because they were equated really with being literally sisters of mercy and literally daughters of charity. When a cholera epidemic left many children orphans in 1850, the church built a new orphanage and school on Market Street. The Daughters of Charity were persuaded to come from Baltimore to care for the children. If you look at the photographs of the 19th century, whether in San Francisco or uh, Archdiocese of San Francisco or elsewhere, and you see the orphan asylums and the schools maintained by the sisters, you see an order, a dignity, a cleanliness. These are the, the poorest of the poor children, and yet the sisters were always insistent that there be good beds, clean linen, uh, that the floors be polished. And that impressed outsiders, the order and dignity uh, with which the sisters conducted uh, their homes as if to express and to reinforce the dignity of each individual child. Other orders of sisters focused on education. The Dominican sisters established the present Dominican University in San Rafael. Next came the sisters of Notre Dame de Namur, who built many schools, including the present Notre Dame University in Belmont. The Sisters of the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary established free schools in their mission to teach poor children. I believe our contribution to San Francisco was the beginning of this um, egalitarian um, aspect of the city where we really taught many different children in the same classroom. And we, there's this wonderful photograph that we have in our archives um, of a classroom and there's boys and girls, um, white children, black children, Hispanic children, all in the same classroom. And when you think of the historical context of the 1850s, 1860s, that was just remarkable. One of um, our sister historians wrote that the children were walking across the sand dunes and uh, coming to the school. There weren't a lot of roads at that time or paved streets, obviously. So the children who were living in these new housing areas were scattered all over the place, I'm sure, in different kinds of homes, and they would be walking to school. A 25-year-old sister from Ireland, Mother Mary Baptist Russell, brought the Sisters of Mercy to the Bay Area a few years later. Their work in the growing city was very different from what they had left at home. We have a letter in, uh, that's in the annals of one of the sisters, and she writes back to the, the Irish sisters and said, you, you poor innocent Irish sisters, you have no idea of what kind of life is here in San Francisco. And then she, she says how we're, we, we're settling quarrels, we're, we're protecting wives from husbands, we're, we're uh, nursing the sick. The Mercies were also busy running their own hospital. By 1857, with donations from the Irish Catholic community, it bought the poorly run county hospital and reopened it as St. Mary's Hospital on Rincon Hill. But that didn't stop them from going where they were needed during the city's smallpox epidemic of 1868. The city very hurriedly built these kind of shacks, like one out near Laguna Honda Home, which was the sand dunes and fog, and there was nothing out there then, and the other one, a couple of months later, near where San Francisco City and County Hospital is now on Petrera Street. And when the sisters read the accounts of how terrible the conditions were in these places, men were the nurses, and usually they were men who already had smallpox, could get another kind of a job, and, and they really didn't attend to the people at all. So the sisters offered their services. They contributed to stabilizing the city in the different works that they did. And teaching young women, too, they brought kind of a refinement to the girls' academies where they taught music and French and more than just the basic curricula. And they formed a good portion of the women of San Francisco to be uh, good in those days, housewives and mothers. But the Mercies didn't limit their service to the care of the sick. Within 20 years of their arrival in San Francisco, they had also opened a home for unemployed women and their children, a facility to care for prostitutes, an industrial school to teach women a trade, and an employment bureau. 